Welcome to the Great Beer State podcast from the Michigan Brewers Guild. The Great Beer State is a weekly show sharing conversations and stories from the passionate people who contribute to our vibrant Michigan beer community. It is made up of a mix between full-length archived interviews from the Guild's first documentary book project, A Rising Tide, Stories from the Michigan Brewers Guild, and conversations recorded in the here and now. Each episode is kicked off with a conversational update from host Scott Graham, Executive Director of the Guild, and the beer evangelist Fred Biltman, author of A Rising Tide. Here's Scott and Fred. Welcome to this episode of Michigan's Great Beer State Podcast. I'm here with Scott Graham, Executive Director for the Michigan Brewers Guild. And we've got another edition here. We're visiting with Brett Vanderkamp of New Holland Brewing Company. Uh, after a few short updates about what's going on around the state uh, in the world of the Michigan brewing community. Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks, Fred. Nice to see you again today. Likewise. So uh, we're we're sort of mid-summer here, uh, maybe even heading towards late summer. Um, what's the news in the, in the world of the Brewers Guild, Beer Fests, and, and our breweries across the state? Well, uh, it's a busy time for everyone, but I think that we're collectively really looking forward to the UP Fall Beer Festival in Marquette uh, on September 11th. This will be 2021. Of course, we missed the event last year, but things uh, we're still moving forward with planning and optimistic that that'll be a, a return to beer festivals and a lot of fun and a chance for us to all uh, get together and have a beer together outside. Yeah, it is really exciting to, to think about and very surreal to realize that it's the longest stretch um, Michigan's been without a beer festival or Brewers Guild Festival since the beginning of Brewers Guild Festival. So it, it's a historic return and uh, it's a great place to do it in beautiful Marquette, Michigan. Yeah, uh, again, really looking forward to it. Uh, I really appreciate our brewery members that are able to participate. It's been a, you know, the last 18 months has been a time of great and unexpected stress in so many different ways for, for breweries as well as you know, restaurants in general, um, bars, you name it, and lots of other businesses too. I don't, I don't mean to leave them out, but you know, everything from trying to figure out how to adapt and survive and understand what the changes mean on a daily or monthly or weekly basis. And, and even after we've come out of things, uh, there just continue to be persistent problems with being able to write a full schedule, uh, having enough staff to operate your business the days you want, the hours you want. Um, people are, are still frustrated and grumpy. You know, they don't, they don't understand sometimes why uh, why you might have empty tables and not be seating them while they're waiting. And it's because you don't have the staff in the kitchen to get the food together or the wait, wait staff or, or whatever. So, and, and then it doesn't take much for one person to get frustrated and grumpy. And then it can be hard for the staff who's been dealing with it. There's definitely some burnout out there. Yeah, absolutely. So it seems like a good time for our, our regular pledge of, of, um, encouraging the beer loving public visiting our pubs and stores and restaurants to uh to summon all the patience and kindness and empathy you you can um it's really encouraging to see the robust business uh that people are doing coming back which was sorely needed but boy um has some challenges in terms of getting through it and handling it so uh deep breaths enjoy the cold crisp michigan brewed beer and, and we'll all get through it yep treat um, uh, treat others like you would want them to treat you right <laughs> that's a good still a good rule of thumb <laughs> yeah it's been a good <laughs> lesson in that for sure so it sounds like a good time to head over to um the brewers dozen our traditional shout out to member breweries across the state who have you uh gathered for us today well, uh, we're back in Southeast Michigan in general um, because there are so many breweries there and there are really lots of different communities. It's, it's much, much more than just Detroit, but I, uh, you know, I'm really calling it um, 
another area in southeast Michigan. So if you're familiar with the geography, you'll you'll be able to identify that these breweries are listed in kind of a a, a geographic pattern if it doesn't seem logical otherwise. But we're going to start in Milford with River Jet, River's Edge Brewing Company. All right, and then we're going to head into New Hudson with Draft Horse Brewery. Followed by Drafting Table Brewing Company in Wixom. And then over in Commerce Township, uh, we've got a long-standing member in CJ's Brewing Company. Yep, and the second brewery in the in that municipality is Kickstand Brewing Company. And then over in Nova, we've got Ascension Brewing Company. And Farmington Brewing Company in Farmington. And over in Northville, we've got Northville Winery and Brewing Company. Yeah, that's the first of a, a cluster of three breweries in Northville, the second being North Center Brewing Company. And then we have Granite City Food and Brewery, who has a location in Northville, as well as Troy and Detroit. Then if we head to Livonia, there are two breweries there, American Harvest Brew Pub at Schoolcraft College, which, Fred, of course, you're affiliated with some of their education. Yep. On uh, a few weeks here, we'll be starting the next semester and um, teaching the uh, the operations marketing and operations course there with uh, lots of other great faculty and uh, you want more about the various educational uh, brewing educational opportunities in Michigan a couple episodes back we've got a great uh, panel of with faculty from all over the place and then also in Livonia home of the first annual Michigan Brewers Guild Summer Beer Festival well, not this location, but Livonia is the home of that first beer fest, and they are now host to Supernatural Brewing Spirits. And we'll wrap things up in Canton with Canton Brew Works. All right, so that's the Brewer's Dozen. Um, give them all a visit and uh, enjoy their beer. And now we'll introduce Brett Vanderkamp, who is uh, another affiliated colleague um, uh, for me. I spent... Uh, just about 13 years at New Holland as a, a minority owner and VP. And um, it was great to sit down with Brett. This is another recording from the archives of Rising Tide Volume 1. So this was recorded at the Knickerbocker in Grand Rapids in the fall of 2018. Um, you know, and Brett has a really interesting perspective. New Holland's had a really interesting um storyline uh, through here in Michigan, adding um, spirits really early on and, and having some unique things. But um, Brett had a lot to share and they were uh, at a really interesting phase in their company when the Brewers Guild first assembled. So I loved hearing that vantage point. And as part of the setup, I guess, or just sharing my disclaimers. So um, I was part of Bell's at the time of the founding of the Brewers Guild. So Brett was a colleague at another brewery. And then later we became uh, business partners with Chase and everybody else. So it was nostalgic for me. What'd you think? Uh, I really enjoyed it. Of course, I've been friends with Brett for a long time. And one of the things that I liked about listening to the interview is that it really focused on, uh, collaboration and association and, and there was a lot of talk uh, about the guild and you know it, and, and I know even today a few years after this is recorded uh, it's something that um, Brett is very supportive of he's been supportive and involved uh, in different ways for many years and it's just it, it's nice to hear him talk about the importance of being engaged and having an association, what, what the benefits are um, in, in commitment to that. And, and a lot of the conversation focused on that. So I thought that was, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. And you really hear it as part of his inspiration for getting into business at all was, was equally community and, and uh, beer and brewing related, which we've heard a lot from uh, personalities across the state and, uh, he shares that. And I also, um, he'll, he mentions it in the interview, interview, but I think it's worth a shout out here is uh, thanking him and New Holland Brewing for the commitment they've made to, um, to contribute hours and, um, you know, dedicated time of personnel to the Brewers Guild specifically. Uh, they've had a board member in one way, shape or form for 
longer than any of us can remember. So there's a lot of volunteer hours involved in terms of not just believing in community, but actually um, putting uh, company personnel's hours into building community, which they've done a lot. Yep, that's a great point. And uh, I, I really, it's something that's easy to not think about, but any company that supports an employee being involved in an association, whether it's the Michigan Brewers Guild or otherwise, it takes some time and focus away from their job, hopefully not too much, but you have to be ready for it. Of course, the, you know, things always happen at an inconvenient time, right? It's my board meeting and mm-hmm. so I'm gone and somebody's looking for me and wants something today. Um, so it, it is a commitment of resources um, and a bit of a diversion and people do it because uh, they think it's good for their own business and good for the industry, which in turn is good for their own business. Yeah. And I think you spoke to that really well. So uh, I think you'll get plenty of nostalgic uh, look back into the early days, as well as a lot of reference points to how it relates to what's going on in that version of today, which I think, a lot, uh, which is 2018. And I think a lot of it still bears true uh, three years later. So uh, without any more introduction, we'll hand it over to Brett Vanderkamp, New Holland Brewing Company at the Knickerbocker in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Take it away. Cheers to Brett. Well, Brett, hello. Hi, Brett. Good to sit down with you. It's great to sit down. We don't great. sit down enough. No, not enough. So we're kind of trading stories here about the Michigan Brewers Guild, and I'd love to start a little bit with uh, kind of your your first entry into the world of brewing, what were the early days like and how did, how did you come to be a brewery in West Michigan? Wow. Well, um, my, first off my entire family, extended families from the West Michigan area. So I have deep roots here, especially we're sitting here on the West side of Grand Rapids and I, both my parents were raised on the West side of Grand Rapids. Um, but I, I grew up in Midland, and ended up going to college at Hope College in Holland, Michigan. And uh, always was a tinkerer, liked to use my hands and build things. And I always liked beer. I, I like beer from the earliest moments of life that I can remember, uh, sipping off my dad's uh, Pabst or Budweiser, or whatever you had in the fridge. And so when I got to college, um, when I was probably not even 21, we started tinkering around with home brewing. Mm-hmm. And uh, that just led me to experiment more and more. We built a bigger and bigger rig and did larger batches and always talked about starting a brewery. Uh, At that time, we were fortunate to have some breweries that were in operation in the state. And even then, uh, out of state that I got to tour and realized you could make a business out of it. And that's pretty much what happened. I graduated from college with a geology degree moved to Colorado, saw what was going on in that scene there with uh, New Belgium and their fat tire, which was hard to explain if you weren't there at the time, but it was just exploding, it was everywhere. And uh, moved back shortly there after moving out there after about three months, four months, moved back to start the brewery. And um, now we're here. Can you tell me a little bit about that, like, I don't know what to call it, I just started thinking about the word shoulder, that, that in a way, so I think it's a familiar story for entrepreneurs, especially in the brewing community, to have been inspired by some brewery or some beer or some experience that they saw that yeah. sort of gave them the belief that it could happen or, or, or a challenge or whatever it was. So there's this inspiration from an existing brewery and then there's, now I gotta create this thing that's my own. What does that transition look like in terms of, uh, wh- what are you trying to make after being inspired by this other example? Yeah, specifically for uh, my experience with New Belgium was one that inspired me to, I guess the inspiration was there was a runway to a real business. And I I don't mean that to put down the other breweries that were around that I saw in the Midwest at the time, but when I was there, New Belgium had just moved from, I think they had a 15 barrel system at an old train like depot thing. And they had moved to their new facility in Fort Collins and had put in a hundred barrel brew yeah. house that was just coming online. And I remember being like, holy shit, like that is serious. That is a real business. Yeah. 
not just a little soup kettle type operation. Well, and having opened in 97, you're talking about early to mid 90s? Yeah, we're talking about 90, we're talking 95. So I think also knowing kind of how the various regions of the country went, in a way you're looking into the future. Exactly. Right? Because you're seeing a market that's 10 years ahead, probably right. comfortably. Yeah, especially Boulder. I mean, right. Boulder was so far ahead, yeah. So that's an interesting thought in terms of like, if you believe it can happen, then you can look and see, oh, well, in that case, then, then with the right things in the pot, home could look like this later. Exactly. And I think I, I, I was just driving around um, the other day in Holland. I, was came, I came down one of the main thoroughfares, which is 16th Street. And I remember, because this is, okay, so now I see a vision for what the runway can be. But the, the feel that we were going from in those early days was far different. And I remember, and I was just driving down 16th Street, and I passed no less than two or three buildings that we had looked at. And I just had this feel of what the vibe we wanted to have, kind of a raw industrial um, vibe that was going on in the building. And, and that kind of was the inspiration. It was really a laid back place you could bring your dog um, have a picnic table set up and enjoy people's company. I mean, and, and so that was really the inspiration. And then behind the scenes was, okay, what kind of beers are we going to make? So it was, it was this almost led by the vibe and the culture we wanted to have. And then the beer was almost, well, we know we're going to make great beer. Um, yeah. but it was almost, that was almost like, well, part it's of like it. your invitation to consider the culture was beer. Correct. And then you're following the culture path and then a way to pave that is beer. So it's almost like bookended with beer. Like yeah. You have the inspiration and the execution. And in the middle is this idea to create a hang and a vibe and a culture. Yeah. And I don't, I think those are very, they're bookended, but they're also very tied together. Yeah. Um, and one has to have the other. Otherwise, you see what kind of happens, um, you know. And so in the path to. Thank you, doctor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're a good man. Cheers. Cheers. In your in your path to open a business, you know, create a brand. You're twenty something. You're you're figuring out your way. Didn't know shit. Yeah, I mean, you've got a, less Still than a, less than a year of professional experience under your belt in right. an unrelated, un entrepreneurial business, right? Yeah. So in the middle of doing all that, um, how would you describe your awareness of the brewing community here in Michigan and maybe, and then tie that into your first guild memory? Yeah. Uh, we were really tied in. Um, a King Brewing Company, I remember, you know, was really up and running at that point. Uh, Bell's clearly uh, was, was a force. Grand Rapids Brewing Company in their, in their brew pub. Um, I'm trying to think of others that we would, um, that stick out in my mind, but we we're absolutely tied in to the existing scene and we knew there were things happening there was a lot of us at this time that were business, relatively relatively speaking yeah keep in mind uh that this is the 90s now not now but it but. felt like a lot compared to 93 right i mean I, i'm just helping uh put that yeah. reflection in context of in 92 93 there's three breweries by 97 there's I don't know, upwards of more than 20, I think. Yeah, that's uh, probably right. And I, I guess where I'm thinking is the, there were business plans floating around. Yeah. And we were crossing paths. And you were hearing about all that. Yeah. And so, like, even in Holland, we had two that were starting around the same time uh, that are no longer there. They were um, uh, Black River Brewing Company and Rafi. Uh, Jim Rafi was getting his operation off the ground. And then in Grand Rapids, you had founders floating around and then the Robert Thomas guys as well. So there were these business plans yeah. uh, that and guys that we had met in passing, uh, whether we were passing each other at banks or whatever, uh, <laughs> you know, that we knew. <laughs> Holding your folders in the uh, yeah. waiting room. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, we had, knew, we had known about this community um, or we knew about others in the community wanting to jump in. And then we knew about the existing community. We were pretty tight in uh, frequenting their establishments. And everybody was very helpful, um, very, very helpful early on when we would go and tour um, uh, some of the uh, breweries and get pointers from them. And uh, which is interesting, you brought up the point about Colorado being 10 years ahead. I actually found the people were less helpful 
in that environment. I remember very clearly uh, one person, and I won't mention the brewery name, it was part of a much larger chain now that's still around, was like, why would we help you? You're going to be a competitor to us, which I just found, you know, anti, uh, it was like the antithesis of what yeah. the industry was about back then. So spinning that forward, then we, we get started um, and it's very early days for us. We started, I think, in July of um, 97. And have you memorial? Do you know the memorialized date of that first meeting? Because it wasn't far. I don't after. know the date, but it had to be that year. It was that fall. Because we incorporated thing. later that year. Yeah, it was that fall, I think. And and then we we ended up at the uh, that uh, bar in what was his name? The owners, uh, uh, Hamilton Street Pub mm -hmm. in Saginaw. I can't remember the owner's name. Right. John. John something because he started Johnny's root beer. Yes, later. he did. He had that, and I that we went up and name. toured. That, that's a great note. We got to figure yeah. out. Yeah, we went up and toured his root beer factory too, which was there. Um, but anyway, yeah, we get this call, and I don't remember who pulled it together. You might have pulled it together. Um, well, Rex, you know, Rex, Rex started the conversation, and then uh, I I felt like I was directing some traffic, but yeah. you know, uh, my my contributions were interestingly enough, you know, sort of counter to the kumbaya place we found ourselves because i was like well rex if you're going to call this meeting you better find neutral territory right yeah i definitely remember because i just remember they're not going to come to our place and we're not going to go here and like you don't want to be in a place where one person's beer is and the other isn't like so right. there there we headed towards saginaw the vacant of craft beer movement yeah. of all places and uh, even right. during the meeting the uh the bud light Truck. truck pulled up in the bay window while we sat there hashing things out it was pretty yeah. ominous so anyways that's what yeah I have you seen that photo floating around on no fa there's a photo f uh, floating around on facebook that the guild may have put up of that meeting uh, where we're all there oh yeah i did see that one. yeah um anyway so so there we are at that meeting and i'll never forget one of the standout memories I, I remember being a positive meeting lots of apprehension about what was, the organization was going to be about by some members and such us included, um, but uh, you know, I remember the, very clearly one of the guys that was just getting started at the time, uh, Brad from Lansing Brewing oh, yeah. Company, and uh, we had toured his brewery, and he had a really cool thing going there early days too. Uh, he got up in the front, and he was just so impassioned about what this we need this we need to stick together, and it was such a simple message. Uh, but none truer. You know, there was no other comments that were more true than just saying, you know, we need each other. We got to get this thing off the ground, and we're stronger together. And that was really the takeaway that I had from from that meeting. All the other stuff on the side, the you know, the the little quarreling or whatever, all seemed to move to the side pretty quickly. Not that any organization doesn't have that, but it, it seemed to get moved to the side for the greater good. Do you remember any evidence as a brewer? So you're less than a year old. Um, so I guess it's tough to know what, how much market perspective you could even have at that point, but do you remember anything being changed by the group coming together, like evidence of, of things that were less, uh, encouraging and, and or brewery sort of bristling against each other versus the helpful thing? Did, did that coming together, did it make dramatic change or did it amplify, uh, an anthem that was already there? I think it amplified the anthem and it started to put, build relationships with your quote unquote competitors, you know, which in turn are your, you know, brothers and sisters in the, yeah. the, the industry. Um, I don't remember that we were particularly, in fact, I, I don't remember we were particularly effective early days um, other than getting together and drinking quite a bit of beer and getting to know each other. Um, you we know, did get a festival out about 18 months later. We did do the festival in Livonia, um, which you, one could question <laughs> how impactful it was. Uh, in, in hindsight, I chuckled. It happened and it was legal. It, it happened, it was legal, barely, probably, and we had the, uh, the probably the most, the most strict law enforcement agency in the state, m highly uh, monitor, highly monitoring, or very... Yeah vigorously monitoring our operation. We gave the city of Livonia a good fire drill on what to do if beer drinking zombie apocalypse was going to happen. Yeah. They're like, activate 
defenses against alcohol. We we gave him a good drink. We did. Not only that, it was like it it heightened the year in year two where they had the 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 trailer. They're coming back right on site. So apparently we failed so miserably year one, or we succeeded in in intoxicating people that year two they felt they needed the uh, alcohol the command trailer. Force. Yeah, the command force SWAT team there. So. Um, yeah, I don't know how. And, and then we, uh, obviously, I don't know if it was a third or fourth year where we, it was a big deal for the guild that we recognized we needed to find a different location. Yeah, I think year three was Frog Island. Yeah, which was a great move. And I was on that uh, yeah, project a little bit. So how, how has your involvement, um, either as an organization, as a brewery, but also uh, you as a professional and entrepreneur, how, as being a member of that um how has that experience influenced you as a as a business person? I would say the most impactful, you know, there's the there's the business aspect, I suppose, that we've been able to do some uh, pretty good things as far as getting some legislation changed and making the environment more conducive and more quote unquote free for doing business. But I say the most impactful thing that's happened to me is the relationships that we were able to develop in those early days. Um, and I think maybe that's, if I look at it now, I hope that's what's still going on with the guild with some of the new entrants where they're meeting folks and finding a space to come together and have beers and chat with each other and get to know each other. Because some of those relationships, when I think of like Mike Plez, Drew Ciora, uh, Tim surprise are so, still people that I can call up and have a conversation. And it's almost as though, you know, from my perspective, it was 15 years ago and we're still, we can call up those folks and have the same conversations and pick right up where, uh, why we need a certain piece of legislation or why, um, this is bad for business. So I think the relationships are probably the most that were developed in the guild early days. And if you think about it, you know, it seems, remarkable I don't know if it's uncommon or, or how unique but a small business in Holland having a uh, you know a um, a relationship longer than a, a decade long with a small business in Rochester uh, is not likely to happen in all industries uh, no and to have that dotted across the state and because you know some of the businesses, like especially distributed brands, you get big enough, you end up in a smaller group and you're crossing paths at distributors and, and at events. Uh, that's one thing. But I think there's, an, there's also connective tissue in the fact that we brought all these small businesses together that could have easily operated out of their own silos and never known each other. And not only do we know about their business, but we know we have relationships with the people. Yeah, I, I think that's special. I mean, you would have, I, I feel like when you bring up like Mike Plez, uh, Andrew and all those guys on the east side of the state. Yeah, bring them in. And, yeah. It's like it would have been really easy. Lenardo's. To, don't forget Lenardo's. Of course, we're seeing yeah. him tomorrow. Yeah, it would have been really easy to never have met them. And, yep, and have no idea what their business is about. And then, and then, if an issue bubbled up, you'd just be like, "Well, I don't know what those guys are doing, but I know what I need." Yeah, yeah, and I think there's an interesting camaraderie, I guess, that builds because of what we would call, you know the crazy commerce clause laws and alcohol laws that maybe bind us together too. Um, but I, to your point, I can't disagree. Well, speak more to that. What binds us together, some of the challenges and sort of the, what, what makes you talk about the legal aspects and how, how does that bring breweries together? Well, again, I mean, I'm assuming we're talking to a pretty educated group of folks here but you know yeah, i mean we're a member fa i mean the priority here is member facing helping breweries understand yeah the importance of all this so you can imagine in there you know um if you're a new member to or a new uh brewer you know trying to imagine what the landscape was like 20 years ago right is probably pretty difficult some of these folks you know you were probably just some of these i say kids could be you know it could have been five or six years old at this time. Um, but hell, they could have been born in 97. They're illegal to open a brewery. Right. Right. It was just amazing to me. But, you know, the, it was, the landscape was a lot different. We were all fighting for a share of mine with our wholesalers. 
Um, we were kind of this unknown entity that was uh, uh, very juvenile, uh, very ignorant in the ways in which politics worked in Lansing. And, and D.C., for that matter, I'd still say we're pretty, you know, who knows what the hell happens in D.C. Um, anymore. But, um, and we're very impacted by regulation. And so trying to get more opportunities to have our fans and consumers try our products is something that one would think would be beneficial for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, however, there are forces at work that would not, and I don't just mean you know prohibitionists, I mean other people uh, that would maybe rather not see that happen for various reasons. And uh, I would say that in their own mind, they're maybe not even bad reasons for why people wouldn't want this. So I think when you talk about why that brings people together, it's like we all wanted to get more people to try our products. And it was a very difficult environment. Just because you got a license and opened up didn't necessarily mean people were going to come try your product because they didn't know what it was. And so trying to get people in your door, trying to have um, access to, what we'll to say, stores and different channels was much more difficult than it is today. Now, it's different today. I'm not saying it was easier or harder or anything, because I think there are different challenges for if you're a new startup today. But you don't have that big hurdle of people not knowing what craft beer is or what a small brewery is. And um, I'm, what I'm seeing is, you know, a lot of people starting up having a lot of success getting people in their doors. And that's yeah. great. And I think the Guild and uh, everybody had a, a lot to do with that. And do you find that there's... Um Oh, I don't know what I want to say there. I guess there are, within the United States or within the world, but especially the United States, there are, you know, there are states and that have strong communities and there are states that are, are more divided or haven't developed either due to regulation or, or whatever. But um, what do you find end up being the hallmarks of a, a and the benefits of a, of a group coming together? Like, how has that made... Um, Michigan, a better place to drink beer, make beer, sell beer? Well, I'm a big believer in, you know, freedom, as you know, and, and free markets and association, freedom to associate. And I think anytime you can get the spontaneous, uh, collaboration and get folks that come together. Uh, uh, with no coercion, so to speak, I think once you do that, you'll be shocked by the creativity that can come out of it. Because I think the individuals, when they they're bo you're born to collaborate from the very first moments you come onto this planet, you know you're looking to collaborate with people to survive. And I think um, that's the beautiful thing about our our uh, our species, I suppose, is we're born yeah. collaborators. And I think when you create those groups that do that, um, just come together and with no other agenda than to kind of promote themselves, which was exactly what the Guild did, um, I think we got some really good ideas that came out of it. Some of them maybe never even materialized. Some of them are yet to be. Yeah, but what I hear you saying is that that experience of collaborating as part of the health regardless of whether the mm. idea comes to fruition that that exchange of yeah. ideas and that and that i don't know that that's healthy energy yeah i think what you i think what you're get driving at is you know when you start to look at maybe states that okay let's go let's just use the guild specifically as an example when we first started we tried to keep politics completely out of the guild which you can debate the legitimacy or why, why the rationale for why that was. But in the end of the day, I think it was a really good thing because we didn't have a lot of the competing. All we want to do is sell more beer and find more fans and develop a community. And I think when you look at some other states that have organizations, they tend to maybe have been started. They came together around a particular political initiative and then they maybe never morphed beyond the politics. And then in, anytime you get into politics, there's winners and losers that come out of that. Somebody's going to get a worse deal than somebody else. It's just the nature of democracy, and it's just the nature of the way 
our political system works. And with the Guild, I think for the most part, we were focusing on win-win for everybody in the organization. And that's specific to the Michigan Guild. And I think some other guilds potentially don't have that going on. And I think that's just part of the ethos and the culture that was started with the Michigan Brewers Guild. And then as we grew up, we were able to take on um, being a political voice for the community, but we were doing it, A, with more maturity, and B, without it being our singular purpose. Yeah. So we had reasons to get together whether there was a wolf at the door or not. Totally agree. We knew each other when the wolf arrived, yeah. too. So, and I think, I think there's also, I should be really clear that I think the Guild, historically speaking, has been very good about making sure they're looking out for all the members and trying to balance the tension that can occur between different interests from different members. I will say that I think going forward, and this, you know, you, what you do with this, what you want is, I think we will have more of these challenges as certain members continue to feel pressure potentially, or if certain members start to feel pressure on sales um, about what, and I, and I think, uh, you know, I, I'm not even, just where this industry is headed, I start to feel like the bigger members may have different agendas than the smaller members. Up to date, I've been very happy with where the board's handled it and um, looking out for all members. I also feel like maybe you can speak to this. Like, So we're heading into challenging times. Our market has matured enough that the the response from the other forces in the, in the market is uh, strong and strategic yeah. and, and limiting. Um, can you imagine heading into the storm without being, uh, without having connective tissue of our community? Like imagine if, if these forces, if we were heading into this in 95 or 96 or, or with the equivalent connective tissue, I feel like we'd be able to be fractured. They'd be able to work us against each other. Like within yeah. seconds, they wouldn't, they wouldn't flinch at dividing us. Totally agree, and I think that um, we're in a much better space now, although I will raise a flag and say I am concerned because I do hear rumblings about, well, the big breweries want this, what about us? And how do we make sure that we stay together collectively is gonna be really important going forward. I mean, you have to look at the industry and say, we currently need to build share. We have to build more share. We're over-indexed for shelf space, compared to what our share is. And the retailers are gonna to start to see this, and we have got to demonstrate that we're still of value, that we are more than maybe just the sum of our sales, but that we are good for the community and we're good for the industry because we build all those things. And we're good for the retailer. And we're good for the, that we build margin. Our customers are important to their store. Yep. Um, beyond our ring. Right. So um, I think getting close to wrapping, I'm thinking about uh, activity and that you've been an active member of the guild New Holland has been active in a number of ways in mm -hmm. terms of providing uh, people and resources, um, board involvement. Um, a lot of this is, is um, geared towards uh, younger breweries, brewery members. Uh, what's the invitation to either engage with the community? Like what are the things they can do to get more out of um, the fact that the guild exists and what's the call to action in terms of, attending board meetings, uh, becoming a board member, getting on a committee. Uh, what's, what's the invitation? Well, Fred, <laughs> you, as uh, anybody who knows uh, that we've been, we have, thank you, we have been a long standing. I don't know what our track, our tenure has been on the, having a board representative on there, but it's been a long time. And it is an investment. You have to make the investment in the guild. Uh, but I promise you, it's like almost all non-for-profits that I've gotten involved in. Um, it, it pays dividends in ways that you can't imagine. Um, and I don't mean that their dividends are necessarily massive dividends. I think that the investment is worth it. However, these dividends come back at you in surprising ways and at different times. I would also say that to the younger members of the organization, um, and I mean this with utmost respect, is you know, 
think about this organization as something that has pedigree and heritage and try and learn as much as you can about the organization and talk with some key individuals from a historical perspective, I think that will give you some insight into how to navigate a little bit and how to get a better understanding about uh, how the organization actually works. I think sometimes I've seen at some of the um, annual meetings, um, not necessarily, you know, the Guild is a very open and uh, gracious organization, uh, maybe sometimes to a fault, but I think sometimes the you can get more done by doing some conversations ahead of time rather than just trying to jam something uh, yeah. through the organization. And at a, you know, 300-member sort of, 300 yeah. member sort of group there's a large there's a smaller portion but a but a active group of us that have been doing this a long time so we don't have to explain everything to one another we just kind of go about we have some instinctual movement of how the meetings work how the group works what do you do here and like yeah. how do you connect to our community and and there's a larger number of people who are coming into this for the first time and i think when you see mm -hmm. Like there's strength in a group that moves well together socially, unless you're out of it. And then you're like, well, I don't know if I can swim in that school of fish. Right. So I do think older members need to hold the door open a little bit. Yeah. And newer members need to be encouraged to like, just take the step. They'll, everything will be fine. Yeah. I feel like we need to say both of those. Right. Things. That's a trust issue, right? It's, but you're right. And how do you build trust? Well, you got to get to know each other first. Right. And, and, and walk the walk a little bit. And to your, I, I think you're absolutely spot on. I think that the, the older members got to be like, all right, this organization is bigger than us now. And that's great. But let's grab a hand here and show these folks almost, I don't want to say mentor. That might be a strong word in this case, but just, hey, have a conversation, pull them aside and just have a little conversation about it and say, hey, great point. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about coming to some of the board meetings that are open right. and having beers with the board after and have your input heard that way? And then ask some of the board members how you think that you could best be used to plug in. You know, and, and really take ownership of it as opposed to saying, what can the guild do for me more? What can I do for the guild? And I think you'll find that that type of symbiosis starts to happen, um, you know, because it is a big, you know, you'll find that there's probably more opportunities for you than you're even prepared for uh, if, right. if you really dive in. And I think a third way to look at that is like, what can I do to be part of the guild is, is that one in between do for the guild. Because I think you want to do for the guild more when you're part of it. Yeah. And the and one of the first steps might be to like, hey, just, just, just try to get in the parade, and attend more and talk more, and then you'll figure you'll want to do more for it once once it's your tribe. Yep. And it, I think it's everybody's tribe already, but not all of them know it. Um, yeah, but, and I think I think that the the guild. I mean, this may be off the record. I think the guild really needs to look at new membership and how they really open up and you know keep keep the heritage that's there, but really open it up to new members to really jump in and and swim. Because, yeah. and I think that well, there's a lot of things coming down the pike that've got to happen. And I that that's probably a different story. But yeah. Uh, I guess wrapping up, what are, are you? What are you most excited for in the community? Looking, looking forward. I think it's like okay. We've kind of brought, we've brought share to a point that they said would be impossible. Um, and now I'm hearing things. Even that, while losing numbers to acquisition, we're still, like that number would be even higher if acquisitions hadn't happened. Yeah, I mean, depending on how you look at it, right? But if we just look at craft beer and what what numbers you want to say, 15% to 20%, you know, remember, remember, I mean, 10 was a stretch. People thought we were crazy. Yeah, remember two and three. Yeah, yeah. But well, they thought we were crazy when we said 10. And so now we're there and now we're, I'm hearing the same rumblings. Like, wow, we're there. We're over-indexed. We're um, flatlining. We're plateauing. So I think the question is, okay, for us all is, where does the growth, you know, we're plugged into the community. We're plugged into the neighborhoods now. Where do we get this growth from? And what does that look like? And to me, that's super exciting. Um, you know, we see the big beer continuing to lose share. Um, 
we see beer overall losing share, but I think that we all knew that was coming because people are drinking less. When you have these type of beers, people are drinking less of them. So I think the volume declines aren't that shocking to me. It's, it's how do we continue the trajectory of gaining share so that we can all continue to grow. And that is the most exciting part. It's the biggest challenge that we have in front of us right now. Yeah. It's also to point to, I think it's also important to point to relevance, like share and growth is one thing. And like, you know, we've become a fabric of the food and drink culture, which has become a larger piece of yep. people's social culture. And like irrelevance would be more damaging. Like, I don't, we don't need any of this. We can do without it. Would erode that growth and sales number faster than some distribution challenges and some, and some density challenges. Yep. Irrelevance would destroy us. Yeah, uh, in a minute. We're tied into the fabric, right? That's, yeah. that's what you're getting And that's at. one of the things we didn't have. Right. When we started out, we were trying to prove our relevance. Like, no, this is good, really. And people were like, what? I don't even know what it is. Like, go away and yeah. go do your hobby. And I just feel like that's one of the significant changes we have now is that we're for real. We're a significant part of the industry. We're a significant part of people's experience. And that's not being questioned. Yeah. As we deal with, as we deal as a society now, and I'm talking about the U.S. specifically, um, but it's probably on a global perspective as well. But as, here in the U.S., we, we, we are winning. I think it's an important message in, in general as a society. We're winning when it comes to poverty. We're getting more wealthy. We're having this abundance. And I think as this new, there, there are certain people, though, that haven't experienced this yet. And as those people start to have more abundance and they're able to make decisions that are based on quality and pedigree and sourcing and origin as those people come into the marketplace that's where a huge opportunity waits um, and who's talking to them and of our industry are we all talking to the same people or now do we even have to broaden even more those are super exciting areas for me that i see growth opportunities for people um, and how do we participate in that so cool yeah it's fun. Thanks for talking, man. Hey, thank you for the invite. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening and sharing while supporting Michigan breweries and craft beer everywhere. The Michigan Brewers Guild was formed in 1997 with its first summer beer festival taking place in July of 1998. It's now five annual festivals are dedicated exclusively to Michigan beer brewed by more than 270 member breweries. The Michigan Brewers Guild exists to promote and protect the passionate Michigan beer industry in every way possible. To learn more, visit us at mibeer.com or say hello on one of our social media pages as we love hearing from you. From coast to coast, from far and near, let's drink Michigan beer. Michigan beer.